my name is Dr. Brianna Gaynor, and today I want to talk to you about three peace of mind tips for navigating through difficult times. Please feel free to ask any questions that you have, and there will be a time later for us to talk through anything that you have a question about. So let's get started. All right, my PowerPoint is not cooperating. Okay, so let's start by, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a clinical psychologist and I have been licensed in the state of Georgia for 10 years. You see the logo on the right-hand side that is Peace of Mind, which is my private practice, Peace of Mind Psychological Services. Um, one of the things that's really important to me in terms of being a psychologist as well as being an owner of a business is being a servant. I think it's important for us to care for the people who not only we serve through work, but also for my employees. It's really important to me that people feel cared for and heard and understood. And the other piece that is important to know about me is that in addition to being a mental health practitioner, I've also had my own experience with mental health. I have experienced a significant loss in the past six years. And it's interesting to be a practitioner, but when you are on the side of actually being a client, you really get to see the powerful and healing work that we do. And so it's even more important to me to help people deal with struggles because I understand what that's like. So what makes this topic important is because it's personal to me. I understand what it means and I understand how to be on the other side of it. And we all know that when we feel like people understand our struggle, it helps us along. And this is very purposeful. And so hopefully through talking through these tips, these can be things that can help you, help your loved ones and help the people that you work with. All right, so next is let's talk about objectives. So what are you going to get out of today? All right, so. The first thing I want to do is I want to introduce the three A's. So we kind of need to know what we're talking about so that I can help you learn how to identify what it is to navigate through difficult times. So after we identify what those three, three A's are, then I want to discuss those impact, the impact of these struggles on children. So we're really going to talk about different developmental stages and how we help children to cope and how we can um, then provide specific resources on how to utilize these in both our own lives as adults, but also helping children, again, based on their developmental level and what the research says about how they tend to cope. And lastly, I want to explore ways on how you can assess each of these areas in your life. So I really want to not only help provide you with information, but real world examples of what you do with this information. All right, so why does this matter? The first is that we all struggle in hard times. And the truth is, it's not if, but it's a win. So it would be to our benefit to know how to navigate the times that are inevitably going to come. In this last year, we have all been in this global pandemic that I'm sure nobody even thought was going to last past the month. I know I didn't. So how do we deal with things as they come? Struggles tend to occur internally and externally. And so internal is about our emotions and our thoughts and our experiences that make us who we are. And then external is about our relationships, the stressors, our jobs, all the things that we can't control. All right, so now let's get to what these three A's are. So my hope is that as we talk through these things and the fact that they're all the same letter, they will be stuck in your mind so you can remember the three A's. Um, as you are just working through life. So the first one is acknowledge. And I will go through each of them individually, but it's acknowledge, ask, and acceptance. Again, acknowledge, ask, and acceptance. Okay, so let's get into them. So acknowledge. So what I wanted to do is really just kind of start talking about what do these words mean? So we can be really clear about these ideas and how they fit a larger framework. And so acknowledge is about accepting or admitting the, the existence or truth of. So admitting what exactly it is that we need. If we don't identify what the problem is, then we can't really work towards solving it. And so the first step in solving any problem is acknowledgement. Again, admitting the existence of whatever it is. 
And so the other part of this is that there are some times when we don't really know what the issue is, but we know there is. So what I also wanted to do is give an assessment in each of these areas. So if you're not quite sure where to start, these are some questions that may start to um, help you identify what that is. And so for acknowledge, the first thing is what is the problem or conflict? So what is going on that's not quite right and what makes it problematic? Or in addition to how is it impacting you? Is it impacting your emotions, you physically, so your ability to sleep? Is it impacting you spiritually, relationally, financially? Oftentimes the things that we struggle with start to impact our functioning, the way we are able to deal with the world, the way that we feel. And sometimes it can be hard to acknowledge those things, but those can be the markers for really needing to sit down and figure out what it is. There are so many times when we can tend to just kind of go through life and deal with whatever it is and drudge through, but I don't believe that that is what we are meant to do. So these are some questions, some things we can start to identify to just consider what may be going on with us, even if we're not quite sure where to start. And so the second is ask. And so what ask is, is a request to ask or do something, a request for something. But again, first we have to be able to acknowledge what is going on in the first place. So the first question with the assessment of asking is what do I need? Name it. So what is that thing? So let me give you exam an example. So let's say I am struggling with work, but I'm not quite sure what it is. I'm having struggles with sleeping because I'm continually thinking about what I need to do, what's going on, what I'm not doing right. That tells me that there's something going in that realm that I need to figure out. And once I figure out that maybe it's about my performance or maybe it's about an insecurity I have, then what do I need to help improve that? Is it about me figuring out how to um, manage my emotions better? Are there some skills that I don't quite have? Do I need to have a conversation with my boss to make sure I'm on the right track? Is there a coworker I need to have a conversation with? What is it that I need? And the other part of it is that before we go ask, because a lot of times when we think about asking, we think about seeking it from other people. That's a part of it. But the first part is about figuring out what we need that only we can provide. So then the next question is, what is that inner voice saying? A lot of times we have that instinct. People call it different things. We call it our instinct. We call it our gumption. People call it God. Whatever you call that thing where you know there's something you need to do or there's something that needs to change or there is um, a challenge you need to face head on. But sometimes, oftentimes, depending on what's going on, we push that away. Have there been times when you've been like, I knew I should have and I didn't. I know I've had a lot of those times. And so if we can start to really trust ourselves, especially thinking back when our instincts were right on target, then that is the first step to asking, to being able to provide those things for ourselves. So in the example of the work difficulty, let me figure out what it is that I'm needing, how I'm feeling, so I know what the first step is. Maybe it's not talking to someone. Maybe I need to build confidence in this area, or maybe there are some skills that I knew that I probably should have worked on that I haven't, or um, some practices I need to put in place so I could be more efficient. What is it that I need to do first before I reach out to others? Because I really, it's really important to be clear about what that looks like for myself, period. And then the next part is, who can provide the support I need? And now this can be challenging because a lot of times there can be barriers to asking for help. So for instance, we can tend to feel sometimes weak or be concerned about rejection. Sometimes there have been instances where we have received rejection when we have asked for things. So maybe that halts us from asking for help in the first place. So what are those barriers that can tend to impact you asking others for help? The other thing is, again, if there have been experiences where we've asked for help and we've been rejected, then it can be hard to really want to continue to seek that out. But although it can be hard to ask for help, the other thing I want you to consider is that 
we ask for help in so many situations. So oftentimes we get someone else to do our taxes. We go to restaurants when we won't, don't wanna cook to get food. We go to trainers, we go to gyms. We seek help in a lot of different areas. So why not allow our mental health to be an additional area that we're open to seeking help when we may not be the expert in that situation? All right, and so the third part of this is acceptance, which is a consent to receive. So being open to receiving whatever comes. First caveat to this is what we, what we just talked about is there's always an opportunity that maybe you're rejected. And so keep in mind that as you're asking, as you're seeking, um, you cannot control other people's reactions. And sometimes that can be really hard and that can be really frustrating, but there is a difference between desire and expectation. Our desires are the things that we want. So maybe in the work situation, now I'm moving towards asking someone for help, talking to a coworker. My desire is for them to help me. And that's totally okay, but they get to choose what they want to do or not. But if I have an expectation, meaning I put a standard on them of something that I believe they're supposed to do or have an idea of what I'm expecting to happen and it doesn't happen, then not only does that lead to frustration and disappointment for me, but it also leads me to be in a place where someone else kind of has control over my emotion because I'm expecting them to do something that they haven't done. So let's really be careful about understanding that even if we put ourselves out there, we cannot control what happens and being okay with the idea that we put ourselves out there in the first place, being proud of that goal, letting the goal be, I was vulnerable, I am seeking help, I'm figuring out what I need and letting that be the only expectation for the situation. So then if there is a no, if the worst case scenario happened, then it's about not only accepting it, but embracing it. So obviously it can lead to disappointment and despair, but it can also be empowering because then you can figure out who your tribe is, who are the people that support you. A lot of times in those hard times when things don't tend to be going well or you don't get the support that you need, what can also happen is that you can start to build some resiliency. You can figure out a new strength or a new way at doing something. So the no is not always bad if we can be open to the possibilities. So, what I, what I want to do next is kind of go through a case example with you, really trying to bring this full circle. And so I want to tell you about an experience that I had about four years ago um, and how I was able to put these things into practice. And so, as I said, I am a clinical psychologist and I've had a practice now for about seven years. But prior to that, I worked for someone. So there was this time period where I went from working for someone to being a leader. And that was challenging because um, you figure a lot of things out <laughs> as you're going through the process and really kind of feeling like, I have the background to do the job. I've had some experience and some consultation around being a leader, but as you know, real life prepares you in a way that the preparation and the classes and the consultation can't until you're in those experiences. And so what I've had to learn with being a leader is relinquishing control, which seems to be totally against what being a leader is. But what I've realized more than anything is that there are just some things I cannot control and I have to be okay with that. I want to fix things, I want things to work. But again, when you're working with people, you can't control what happens. And so what happened those the four years ago was the perfect storm. So there were people who, so I started by myself, then I, then I, um hired an office manager. And then there were therapists working for me. We had an office admin. So at this time we had about six people in the office and there were personalities, people who just did not get along. Can you imagine, or have you ever had the experience of walking into your office and you were not comfortable? You just feel the tension. It's not that there was a lot of arguing, but there was tension. And then there were times where it was hard to make sure that I could 
keep up with payroll. And that's stressful. I need to be able to pay people and keep the office running. And then my highest paid therapist quit in our slow season. So January, February, at least before the pandemic, tended to be the slower time people were coming back from holidays. So that's the time when clients were low and the person who made the most money decided she was leaving. And then I had a desire for public speaking. So long story short, there were a lot of different things going on and it was extremely stressful. And I really needed to figure out how to conquer or how to deal with all of this. And so, the first part of it was acknowledgement. So what did I need? I needed a new therapist because that was important. This was the person who saw the most people. I needed to be able to be able to put her clients somewhere and make sure that we could still see clients. And then I realized I also needed help with payroll. So how do I make sure that I can keep office running, that I have funds coming in? And then on top of all of that, that was happening in my practice, I had a need to be a coach, I, want, I mean, I wanted to be a speaker, but that is not my level of expertise. So I needed to find someone who could help me with that. And so the next thing was asking. So I put out an ad for employment because I needed to let people know that we were looking for someone to come in. And then I needed to talk to my CPA. So what do I do when I'm having these payroll issues? And they sent me to a bank. I had to, again, talk about, okay, what are my options? so that I can make sure that we continuously have money flowing. And I had to seek out and begin working with a coach. So again, this was the big part of relinquishing a lot of that control and identifying that although I knew what I was doing in my realm, there were other people who could help support me to help this go better. And with acknowledgement came the fact that I could not control how some of these things worked. So with the therapist, it took three months. And that was extremely frustrating because I want things to move the way I need them to move. This is the way it's supposed to be. And yet that's not the reality of the situation. And so I had to trust that I had done my part and I had to let everything else fall into place. And it did eventually, but I had to be okay with the fact that I could not rush that process. And not only did I get the support with payroll, in terms of getting a line of credit and talking to the bank about what that looked like, but I had to be open to using it. I had to be open to utilizing that level of support if I needed it and not feeling like there was something wrong if I did. And then I had to realize again, I'm not an expert in anything. So I really needed someone to help me with this new venture that I wanted to take on. Okay, so this is the basis for the talk. Acknowledge, ask, and accept. Now, what I also wanna do is talk about how we can help children with these areas. Because the truth is, how do any of us learn to cope? It's not something that just happens. It's something that we're taught. So if we can identify how to also help our children with this, we will all be able to manage emotions better and be better functioning. They'll be better functioning adults as they grow up. And so the basis for this developmental piece is Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. And so what I love about this, um, about his theory is that it really talks about the different conflicts that we deal with throughout our life. Um, and as we deal with and are able to overcome conflicts, it helps with growth developmentally. And the opposite happens when we're not able to deal with that conflict, it can impact our development in that area. So it starts with trust and mistrust. So that attachment phase in childhood to integrity versus despair, and really um, our appreciation of our life and a life well lived in our later years of life. So I'm gonna talk about three specific excuse me, groups. We're going to talk about preschoolers, middle childhood, and adolescents. And I'm going to share with you some research I found. And so let's talk about the preschoolers first. And with all of these, I'm going to start with what the developmental stage is. And so for preschoolers, it's about initiative versus guilt. So it's about learning to initiate tasks. So them exploring and really finding purpose. And so in the study that I looked at, it found that during this time, children begin to understand what their emotions are and how they are expressed in themselves and others. So they're really figuring out what emotions look like. 
the limit is they don't, they're not able to really generalize that outside of the specific situation. And so what was found in this article was that the emotional knowledge of four, of three and four-year-olds, excuse me, was impacted by their mother's display of positive emotions, attentiveness, and being able to provide a solution. So providing a solution was showing them how to deal with their emotions and also helping them to solve the problems that they were dealing with. Um, what was interesting about this article is that in the people that they worked with, they did a few different things. So they coded the interactions between parents and child, looking at whether or not their emotions matched in different situations. They identified, of course, the child's knowledge of emotions by um, ha having them identify specific feeling faces and emotions. And they also had the parents fill out different attentiveness scales. Um, they also found that children at age five were able to understand mixed emotions. So the idea that someone can feel both happy and sad um, most when their mothers accepted, uh, when mothers were accepting of their emotions. So again, the big, big take home, the big take home of this article was that when mothers were attentive to their children's emotions, displayed positive emotions and helped them work through their emotions, they really had a better knowledge of emotions just in general. They also found that the knowledge of emotion at age three was most impacted by the mother's positive attitude and actively helping her child learn about emotions. So really paying attention to how they felt, not ignoring it and really helping them to work through it. Now, what was interesting too, is that this article also looked at father's engagement with children. And what was found was that only the only group that was impacted by the father's socialization of emotion was the four-year-olds um, in their expression uh, and situational knowledge. And so one of the hypotheses that the article had was that maybe fathers tended to talk and explain more about emotions, particularly when their children were poor at understanding. So maybe as children got older, if they didn't understand as much, then that's when the father was more proactive in talking more about emotions and helping them to understand it. So lastly, there was also a domino effect. And so a parent's own experience of emotional expressiveness indicated their attitude about teaching their children about emotions, which also impacted their children's emotional knowledge. So how we see emotions and our experience impacts the way we will um, view and teach our children about emotions and the way we teach our children about emotions will impact their knowledge overall. So that doesn't mean that if we haven't had the best experience in emotional expressiveness that we will not um, be good at or be attentive to our children. It just means that it's important for us to be aware that that makes an impact. So the more we're aware that it's important to make sure that we are being attentive, that those things help children have better emotional knowledge, the better they will be later on. And so the next thing was middle childhood. So this was really, um, particularly with the research that I looked at, it looked at children between eight and 10 years old. And when we're talking about middle childhood, the, um, the developmental stage is really about industry versus inferiority. And so it's really about them having a need for enjoyment of applying and mastering skills, having confidence in what they do, and the large tasks that they're really focused on is school, really feeling good about that and really being able to see the differences between them and their peers in terms of their achievement. And so the study assessed the relationship between a child's emotional clarity, their response to coping with stress, and depression. So was there a relationship between these three things? And emotional clarity was basically their awareness and understanding of their emotions. So again, building on the younger children, now they are able to understand their emotions clearly and also able to generalize better. Stress was about peer harassment or being treated negatively by peers. And what you'll notice is that in these articles, overall, the most important thing for children um, developmentally appropriate is that stress related to their peer relationships overall, that was the biggest thing that they struggled with. Um, and coping, 
there were four different types of coping that they looked at in this research. Engagement, disengagement, involuntary disengagement, and, involu and involuntary engagement. So engagement was about being action-oriented, proactive, positive thinking. So really engaging and trying to come up with a solution to how to deal with their emotions. Disengagement was avoidance or denial, not dealing with it and just avoiding it. Um, involuntary engagement was about a lot of anxiety. So rumination, having those thoughts that go on and on, physiological arousal, my stomach hurts, I don't feel good. So again, that involuntary engagement was about a lot of those anxiety symptoms. And then involuntary disengagement was about escape or emotional numbing, doing something else um, to avoid dealing with or experiencing this emotion that I'm having. So what they found was that there was a relationship between a child's ability to understand their emotions, these stressful situations with their peers, and experiencing depressive symptoms. Interestingly, there was an association between a lack of emotional clarity and most and the coping skills that tended to be most related to not struggling with your emotions was more of the rumination, the anxiety, which is likely why we see a lot of that anxiety and fear that children can tend to have when they're struggling emotionally. And then disengagement, just avoiding altogether. And they tended to use less engagement or less of those um, problem solving, um, positive thinking, really trying to solve the problem or deal with it. Interestingly, there was not a, there was a weakness or not a specific direct relationship between emotional clarity and disengagement. So while a lot of the coping skills that obviously we would want children to not utilize as much, the disengagement, the involuntary engagement and involuntary disengagement were a mediator between depressive symptoms and not understanding your emotions, there was not a direct relationship between disengagement in and of itself and emotional clarity. And the hypothesis there um, that the writers indicated is that maybe disengagement in and of itself was too advanced of a skill. So children this young weren't necessarily using in disengagement, so just avoiding or emotional numbing, but they were experiencing anxiety. Um, and they were experiencing a lot of that rumination and just trying to avoid things, but the emotional numbing wasn't something that they had developed as a skill consistently. All right, so the next thing that I found is an article that really looked at gender differences and it looked at elementary and high school children. So it looked at three different groups. The first group was the older elementary school students, which were third and fourth graders. The, then there were what they labeled as early adolescents, which was fifth and sixth graders, and then middle adolescents, which were seventh and eighth graders. And it was really interesting to identify the gender differences. So what they noted, which is similar to what I stated earlier, was that both genders inevitably by large numbers, were much more distressed by a social stressor than an academic stressor. So when there were issues with homework, that did not seem to cause as much of a significant concern as an argument with a friend, which again is developmentally appropriate. So boys tended to use more avoidant coping. So avoidant coping is just disengagement and not dealing with it at all. So as they're getting older, it seems as though disengagement is becoming more of a coping skill. Girls use more social support and problem solving. But the other two coping skills that they looked at, which were palliative emotional regulation and anger-related emotional regulation, there were no gender differences. So let me tell you what those are. Palliative emotional regulation is about relaxation and distraction. So trying to manage my own emotions while anger related emotional regulation is about externalizing anger or fury, showing anger, showing frustration. And so, 
oops, sorry, I think I muted myself. What was also found is that there was also a difference in coping skills based on age. So older children tended to use more problem solving skills. Interestingly, with avoidance, there was an interesting correlation because while the early aged adolescents, which were the um, fifth and sixth graders, tended to be the group that uses the least avoidance, the children who were younger than them and the children that were older than them used more avoidant coping skills. And then the middle aged adolescent group, which is the older group, um, they used more of the palliative and the um, anger related emotional regulation. So again, the distraction and the relaxation, as well as expressing their anger. There were no age differences related to the use of social support. And just to sum this up, coping used for a social stressor tended to overall um, be focused on either problem solving, avoidance, expressing anger, or social support. And so adolescents, so they are really in this area of identity versus role confusion. So needing to develop their identity, figure out who they are and social relationships by far are the most important thing to them at this stage. And so looking, the article that I found looked at adolescents and adult coping skills and how their coping skills related to their expression of anxiety and depression. And they all, they both tended to use the same coping skills, but the use of that increased from adolescence to adulthood, similar to what we've seen with the children. As you get older, you tend to use a lot more coping skills. They develop either in a positive way or a negative way. The most significant predictor of psychopathology in this article, was, which was related to anxiety and depression, was the use of self-blame, rumination, so kind of having those thoughts that go on and on that we have struggles to manage and then catastrophizing. So catastrophizing was the weakest coping skill related to psychopathology, but it was still related to those struggles with anxiety and depression. Interestingly, the most significant difference, um, which tended to lead to less anxiety and depression was the use of positive appraisal. But, adults were much more likely to be able to identify a positive meaning to negative life events than adolescents. And when they did, they tended to struggle a lot less emotionally. All right, so I've talked about the three A's, acknowledge, ask, and accept, and then what this looks like in children, how they are impacted by coping. So for me, the most important part is I can give you the information, but what do you do with it? So hopefully this will give you some real world, world tips on how to deal with each area. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can deal with it first as adults, and then I'll give some suggestions on how to help our children. So going back to acknowledge, um, often when we're quiet and away from distractions and voices, the answer is much clearer. Um, so when we're needing to acknowledge what's going on, figuring out how we're feeling, what our conflict is, how we're being impacted, a lot of times it's important to get away so that we can really take some time to figure that out and hear that inner voice that I spoke about a little earlier. And so meditation is one thing. And what I'm going to do in the next slide is go through what that looks like. Journaling. And so a lot of times, though, I've noticed that when I talk to clients about journaling, they kind of struggle because it's like, OK, what do I do? Do I just write? Sometimes we need a little guidance. So here are some prompts. What is the thing I worry most about? And if I could change one thing to improve these worries, what would it be? Now, journaling may not be the best for everyone, but it can be really helpful. I notice that sometimes when I am uncertain of how I'm feeling or what's going on, once I start writing, it just comes to me and it helps me to process my thoughts. Mindfulness. So mindfulness is I'm sure you guys all know it's about being present in the moment, focusing on what is. We have such busy lives. We are doing so much. I know a lot of times, even with me working from home, I'm trying to manage home stuff and work stuff. And it can be difficult to separate the two, especially because we've been working from home for so long. So really taking some time to be mindful and focused on the here and now is really important. And then deep breathing exercises. A lot of times getting in touch with our body and how we're feeling 
is by focusing on our breath. And this one, I do not want to forget. Talking to someone you trust. Having that person who loves you and who supports you, but who will tell you the truth. I have a best friend who will call me out all the time. And sometimes I don't like it, but I'm going to continue to call her because I know that she knows me and she cares. And sometimes being able to have those conversations from someone who supports you, from someone who will hear you, especially being a mental health practitioner, I noticed that not only do I do this as a job, but in my personal life, people tend to just unload. And so it's important that we have a place that we can also unload, that we can be vulnerable, that we can also feel heard as we are giving so much of ourselves. So let's talk a little bit about meditation. And here's a script that hopefully you can utilize. Um, so the purpose is to train your mind um, so that you can focus and redirect your thoughts. The idea is that this helps to reduce stress and improve concentration. And so it should include the following, being in a calm environment. Now, calm is different to everyone. For some people that may be quiet and distraction free and some people need a little music or background noise. All of that is okay. Closing your eyes is really important and taking deep breaths. So really allowing your focus to be on your breath. And a lot of times if we can close our eyes, it shuts out the distractions. What I recommend is counting in for four, holding the breath for four, and then out for four. A lot of times when we're focusing on not only our breaths, but counting, it helps us to avoid some of the other distractions. And then when your thoughts start to linger, just bring them back to your breath. Most importantly, though, there's no judgment. The important thing about meditation is not to judge yourself if you are thinking about what you need to do in a few minutes or what you did yesterday or someone that you need to send an email to. Don't judge yourself. Just be. If you do it for two minutes versus five minutes, this is just about helping you. So let this practice serve you and don't worry about it needing to look like anything in particular. So asking. Now there's the internal. So self-care, what's working and what's not? And boundaries. So when we think of boundaries, we often think of boundaries with other people. But what about boundaries with ourselves? Am I serving myself in getting enough sleep? Am I listening to my body? Am I getting up and giving myself sun? Um, am I doing the things I need to do for myself so I can be best for everyone else? That's really, really important. And I think that we underestimate it. What can I change in my schedule to support myself? For me, being home now, I've really had to be much more cognizant about taking a lunch break, taking a break from work because I can just work and work and work. I don't have to go anywhere and really giving myself that time and space to just breathe. And then what do I need to say no to? And is there a balance? Am I saying no too much or not enough? That's really important because it's important for our nose to be nose, but for them to be impactful. So am I saying it too much where I'm not allowing things that could be good for me? Or am I not saying no enough where maybe there are some things I need to say to no to just for a season? Um, one of the things I always like to equate this to is when you get on a plane, they always tell you that you need to put the mask on yourself before anybody else. Why? I usually ask clients that if I tried to put it on you first, maybe I would achieve it or maybe I would die before it. But if I put it on myself, how many more people can I help? It's the same thing with self-care. It's not selfish. It's me being the best for me so I can be the best for everyone else. And so let's look at a little self-care inventory. So physical, healthy eating, water intake, am I eating what replenishes my body? Am I drinking enough water? Am I moving? And with movement, it's about enjoyment. So is this something that I'm gonna do long-term? My sister loves to walk because she, it clears her mind. So she's not someone who's gonna do an exercise tape and that's okay. But let me make sure that I'm doing these things that work well for my body. And then the cognitive piece, am I focusing on the thoughts I'm having? We have millions of thoughts a day. So we can't control all the thoughts that come in, but we can control the ones that land. 
And if there are negative thoughts that are happening, I really need to try to work on and adjust those things. And then gratefulness. How often do we, it's really easy to focus on what's not going right, but what about what is going right? Some of the things when I'm stressed out, I try to remind myself of is in this year of pandemic and everything that's happened, I still have clothing, I still have shelter. There's, there's always something to be grateful for. And sometimes that can help us through the struggles. And then emotionally, are there affirmations? What do I need to hear? A lot of times we're looking for other people to validate us, but what are the things I need to hear that uplift me that maybe I need to put on my mirror? And then just checking in with my emotions. How am I feeling today? And what do I need? So asking for the external. So what areas am I struggling in that I could use help in? Is it emotional, financial, physical? And who can I reach out to? Again, we ask for help in a lot of different areas. So why not with this? And then this is also something that I just wanted to make sure to, to give. When it comes to mental health, there are times when there are things that we can handle on our own and times when there are things we can't. So this really highlights the difference. So if our functioning is impacted, if we're having severe symptoms that are lasting longer than two weeks, if we're having thoughts of wanting to hurt ourselves, then those are times when we can seek professional help. And so this highlights the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, and really talking about when we may need more help than we can give ourselves. And finally, acceptance. And knowing that with acceptance comes rejection as well. And so with acceptance, it's about who I am and what I need and avoiding the comparison trap. You are a one of a kind, no one is like you. And so to compare yourself to someone else, it's not a fair comparison. And likely your life is set up for you, not anyone else. So be careful to enjoy who you are and not try to be like anyone else because the grass is generally not always greener. And then with rejection, what's the worst that can happen and can you handle it? If you could handle someone saying no and still be okay, then it's worth it. And so this is a mantra I just wanted to put in there um, because again, it can be hard to ask for help, but I want you to know that you can only control yourself. So I can only control me. And while I ask others for help, I will accept however they respond. I can deal with it even if the worst happens. And if there's a no, maybe there's another way that you could get the help that you need. All right, so. These are some self-acceptance affirmations. So maybe these are some things you need to hear that you need to remind yourself of, that you accept yourself exactly as you are, that you are perfect just as you are, and that you are enough. So how do we help children? So with acknowledgement is normalizing the fact that it's okay to feel however you feel. And one of the things that the article showed more than anything is that how we show and what we do rather than what we say impacts children the most. And because there is a gender difference in seeking support, it's important that we encourage our boys as much as our girls to talk about their feelings and to seek help and to try to improve their coping skills overall and not utilize avoidance. With asking for preschoolers, the most important predictor were their parents attending to their emotions and modeling how to cope. For middle children, it was important that they understood their emotions. So again, what we're showing them and helping them to work through their emotions. And then for adolescents, overall, they needed support and how to look at situations differently in more of a positive way. And lastly, modeling ways to deal with emotions. So are you asking for support or talking about how to problem solve or showing that it's okay to express your emotions? And then acceptance. So let's talk to youth about disappointment. And that sometimes it sucks. It doesn't feel great, but we can't control others. And really allowing them to be able to feel their emotions and also have time to themselves to learn how to manage how they feel. So what I wanted to leave you with also is an example of how to talk to our kids about feelings. So First, let's help them address the upset. So helping them label their emotions. So 
You're crying. Are you sad? You seem mad. How does your body feel? Helping them identify what emotions look like, not only in what their face is doing, but what their body is doing. So is your stomach is your stomach hurting? Are you feeling shaky? Are you feeling nervous? Really helping them to associate everything that goes along with their emotions. And then letting their feelings out. So these are some examples. Go outside and yell, scream in a pillow, run, exercise, taking time alone, but giving them those suggestions, encouraging them to utilize that so that they know how to cope or how to start to build that repertoire for themselves. And then figuring out how to deal with feelings. So helping them to identify a solution. So it's okay to be angry, but not aggressive. And what are some things we can do? Can we ask for help from an adult? Do we need to apologize? Do we need to talk about how we're feeling? Just really helping walking them through that whole process. And so now I wanna ask questions. I do have a slide on how to contact me, but I know we are running out of time. So if there are any questions that we have that I can answer in the next few minutes, I'd be happy to. I have a question. Hi. Um, hello, I just wanna thank you so much. This is such great information. I can't wait to disseminate to my staff, to my parents and just apply some of this stuff to myself. Yeah. But my question is, will you have the PowerPoints available um, for us? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Awesome, and how can we access it? Just through the main website of yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at um, <laughs> the chat now. Um, so yes, you'll have access. You're going to email at the end of the day and you'll have access to the PowerPoint. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a question. Um, for teenagers who are like 13, 14 year old, years old and they're very... Um, fairly quiet in therapy and very introverted. Um, you know, they're, they've been homeschooled all this time. They're going into high school for the first time. Yeah. Um, how do you get them to start expressing how they feel? And, you know, that I call them the one word. <laughs> and sometimes I'm happy to get a word. Yes, um, it's challenging. I think it's about time. And one of the things I've noticed a lot with teenagers, um, what they love is they love, sometimes when I disclose, so I have to obviously think of what I want to disclose. And sometimes it's not the full story, but they love, they love when you talk about the things that you've experienced as well, when they feel like it's a back and forth conversation. And sometimes when I give real world examples, I feel like that helps them connect a little more. Um, and then sometimes I also find that helping kind of talk about social situations and also giving them outside perspectives and see how they feel about it can start to help them just open up and talking about emotions, period. But I think it's also just a time thing. And the more comfortable with they, that they are with you, you'd be surprised eventually all of a sudden one day it's like, oh, Okay, <laughs> you're sharing. I actually have a um, client who I start just the same as you're talking about now, started in high school, um, really didn't say much. So it was really about rapport building, talking about different situations, sharing with her. And now she's 18. And the thing she shares with me, I'm just like, oh my gosh, is this the same person? So just keep mm -hmm. going. They'll get it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hope that helps. <laughs> Anybody else? I put some questions in the chat for okay. participants who wanted SE credit. I'm sorry, what was the? Oh, I just put, um, there's a few questions I had to put in the chat for any of the participants who wanted um, to receive credit for, receive, for viewing the presentation. Okay. Yeah, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Um, I'm working with autist, um, children on the autistic spectrum disorder and, you know, quickly finding out um, many females who 
um, have been undiagnosed for a great length of time. Mm. And also, you know, you've an adult who have alexithymia. How could your approach um, assist in me supporting them better? Well, I, I think really kind of going back to where they are developmentally. So obviously when we're talking about people on the spectrum, it's not going to be on the same trajectory as typical children. And so um, really helping them start with the basics of identifying emotions, being able to understand what different faces look like, being able to understand what their body feels like, making sure that they have those um, foundations that we talk about with preschoolers first, and then we move into helping them understand in a broader social situation, but really just helping giving them those basics from the beginning is gonna be really important to be able to move them up. But also understanding that it's going to be a process and that they're not going to be necessarily where you, you would expect based on their um, diagnosis and their development. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Dallas, I know you said you, those questions are for people who want CEU credit. Were there questions for me in there or? I think you answered. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I think you answered them all. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope that this was helpful. For me, whenever I go to presentations, the information is great, but what do I do with it? How do I apply this? So I really hope that I was able to give you guys some useful tips on how to apply this for yourselves and for others. It's a good reminder for me <laughs> because we are all going through life right now. So um, I really appreciate you guys joining. I really appreciate your questions and thank you so much. Um, any other questions before I end? No, but thank you because I will definitely use the um, <clears throat> the three A's and starting a conversation, uh, you know, with my client and see if that helps her open up a little bit more. And because I feel stuck. Yeah. <laughs> I feel stuck with her sometimes. So, yeah. but also, if I could say, I don't think it's a bad thing to say that, you know, I, I want to help you. I feel like you know, these are the gains we've made, but I want to make sure we're connecting. Where are we with this? Having that conversation. And while you may not get a lot, it, it means a lot to know that I just kind of want to check in with you with where we are. I've noticed a lot, I think with clients, they don't really say anything mm -hmm. and then they're frustrated. And maybe sometimes we need to have that conversation to really open things up. Let's talk about what's working and what's not because she may have a totally different perspective. So I think it's perfectly appropriate to have that conversation and that may open up even more. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, All right. Awesome. Well, good luck with everything. Um, and it was Excuse a pleasure. Me. Excuse me. Day. Yes, ma'am. Did yeah. you say you were located in Georgia? Yes, I am. Where in Georgia? I'm in Johns Creek, Georgia, Fulton County. Can you send your contact information? Uh, yeah, so that so that was one of my um, resources. <laughs> I should have wrote it down. I missed it. <laughs> no, 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 you didn't miss it. I put it towards the end. So this oh, is my okay. contact information. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it will be in the PowerPoint as well. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. No problem. All right, guys. I think my time is up. It was a pleasure. You will get these PowerPoints. Um, and again, thank you for joining and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.